Turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew 27. And as you're turning there, just a quick question. How does Easter end? Come on, this is an easy one. It ends with an R. All right, so make this a little better. What's the best way to make Easter easier? You change the T to an I. It goes from Easter to easier. All right. Some of you got it. Anyhow, this is Palm Sunday, amen, the start of what is known as Passion Week, the holiest week of all Christianity. And that week was kicked off by Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of a humble donkey. And as he entered, they laid palms before him at the first Palm Sunday. The very next day, Monday of that week, Jesus cursed a fig tree, and he cleansed the temple of the, of the change makers. Tuesday, he debated with the Pharisees uh, and, the, and the Sadducees. He preached the Olivet Discourse, and Tuesday was also the day that Judas plotted his betrayal. Wednesday was a travel day, uh, spent most of the day in Bethany. Thursday, Jesus hosts the Last Supper with the disciples. He preaches in the, the upper room discourse. Then he heads out to the Garden of Gethsemane after dinner for prayer. Friday morning, he's arrested. He has six trials. First was before Annas, then Caiaphas, then he went before the Sanhedrin, then he went before uh, Pilate, and after Pilate, he went to Herod, and Herod sent him back to Pilate for his final um, trial. He's mocked, he's beaten, he's crucified, and then buried in a borrowed grave, the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. Quite a week, wasn't it? And I look back and think, what did I do last week, <laughs> amen? Amen. Quite a week. Many of us are familiar with um, these events, but this morning I want us to focus on a group of men. We hear them referenced a lot of times uh, throughout the Easter passages and, and the Easter stories that we read, but they're rarely preached upon. And this morning I want us to focus on the Roman soldiers at the cross. Let's pick up in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, skip down to verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they rammed it on his head and, a reed, uh, and put a reed in his hand, in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed, and they struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull. They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. Calvary's cross, it's a vivid display of contrast. On one side, you have Christ and his compassion. On the other side, you have mankind and his carelessness. On one side, you have Christ and his righteousness. On the other, you have mankind 
in his complete re rebellion against God. One side you have Christ and his unconditional love. On the other you have mankind and his selfish laws. The cross. Where God gave his best. And we, mankind, showed our worst. Looking up at it, Jesus was paying our sin debt. Looking down from it, Jesus saw soldiers gambling for his garments. First thing I want us to see this morning, as they were sitting down, they watched him there and they watched him complacently. Verse 36 says, sitting down, they watched him there. You see, these soldiers, they had witnessed many, many crucifixions throughout history. In King Darius' days, King Darius himself crucified about 200 people when he conquered Babylon. Alexander the Great, he crucified about 2,000 people when he conquered Tyre. So for the Roman soldiers, crucifixion, it was just a common means of capital punishment for them. To them, this was just another day, just another crucifixion. These soldiers, these Roman soldiers were complacent while the precious Lamb of God was crucified. They were near him, but they weren't close to him. They could have touched him, but they chose to ignore him. They could have put their faith and trust in him, but instead they chose to mock him. These soldiers were reckless with their redemption. They were reckless with mankind's only redeemer. They knew of his miracles. They heard his words. They heard his claims. Yet they chose to ignore why he came and what he came to do. Today, sadly enough, most have become just as complacent with Calvary's cross and its Savior. To most, it means so little. How do we know? Just look in the church houses. Today's Palm Sunday, the church house should be packed, but most people are still at home. Amen? They live for the world, but they ignore its very own creator. Amen? They've heard about God's unconditional love, but they choose to cling to the world's unsatisfying lust. They know about Jesus' sacrifice but they're not willing to turn away from their sins. We think about Christ. Who is this Messiah? Who is this Redeemer who gave his life for us? To the artist, he's the one altogether lovely. To the architect, he is the cornerstone. To the banker, he's the hidden treasure. To the builder, he's the sure foundation. To the farmer, he is the Lord of the harvest. To the baker, he is the bread of life. To the blind, he is the light of the world. To the carpenter, he's the door. To the sheep, he is the good shepherd. To the gardener, he's the true vine. To the philosopher, he is the way and the truth. To the dying, he is the resurrection and the life. To the educator, he is the new and living way. To the sinner, he is the friend who ate with them. To the sick, he is the great physician. To the demon, he's the one who makes them tremble. To the guilty, he is the holy and righteous judge. To me, he's my precious Lord and Savior. Amen. Give him praise this morning. He is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And if we would slow down, if we would just take time and pause from our busy schedules and truly see, truly understand the one who gave his life for us. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, our very creator. We will never be the same. Amen. 
never be the same. Not only did they watch him complacently, but they also watched him calmly. This was the hour of the ages. This was the world's darkest hour. And they were not even moved. Not even in the slightest. They were mere observers. As the scene unfolded right before them. And as we read here in Matthew chapter 27. We see that these soldiers. They were there. They were there as Christ was nailed to that cross. But who else was there? Look down at verse 38. Then two robbers, two thieves, were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. So we see not only were these soldiers there, but we see there were two thieves that were crucified with him. They were there also. Verse 39. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Who else was there? The crowd. But what we need to understand, this wasn't the common citizens of Jerusalem. This crowd was handpicked by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They handpicked that crowd to stand before Pilate to chant, crucify him. And this was the same crowd that they brought to the uh, foot of the cross to mock Christ. Verse 41. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and the elders as they said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. Who else was there? The priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all the Jewish religious leaders. They were there watching him as well. Skip down to verse 55. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there. That small, faithful band of followers, they were there at the foot of the cross. Who else was there? We also know that the fear-filled disciples were there. But they were watching from afar off in complete disbelief of what they were seeing. This was their Messiah, the one they thought was going to deliver them from their bondage. But they were still blinded. Jesus was indeed there to deliver them from their bondage, but from their spiritual bondage, not from the physical. And they couldn't quite see it yet. All of them were there, but none of them had any idea of the magnitude of the events that were unfolding before them. None of them fully aware of the forces of heaven that stood poised and ready at the moment. Hundreds of thousands of mighty angels ready and willing. The earth and mankind hovering between destruction and deliverance. All of a sudden, the Bible tells us that the skies darkened and the ground began to shake. Verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. It took an ungodly pagan Roman centurion to finally finally declare who Jesus truly was. He said, this was indeed the Son of God. Today, we need to understand that we're at another crossroad. This world 
is on the verge of God's wrath and his judgment. We are moving rapidly towards the last days. Watch the news, read the newspapers. The end times are at our very doorstep. Jesus gave us a glimpse of what that would look like. Matthew chapter 24, probably one of the the best chapters on the end times and and what it's going to look like. Picking up in verse 7. Jesus said, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. He said, all of these are just the beginning of sorrows. Wars and nations invading one another. It's right in our headlines today. Russia invading Ukraine. You hear all over the news, China getting ready to invade Taiwan. Then we see most recently that China and Russia have now uh, formed this alliance, joining forces just as God outlined in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. Rising oil prices and world demand has set the stage for a conflict, a major war in the Middle East. Pestilence, Jesus talked about, and disease and famine. We see viruses and, and pestilence, not only epidemic, but pandemic. You know, we're just coming off of three years of the coronavirus. And before that, you know, it was the avian flu and, and this and that and pandemics and, and pestilence just keep rising. Massive earthquakes. You know, just a few weeks ago, there was a massive earthquake at the border of Turkey and Syria. Over 50 thousand lives lost in just one earthquake verse 9 jesus said then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake and then many will be offended many will betray one another and will hate one another then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We see today more false teachers and false prophets and more deception than ever, ever before. We see more conservative Christian prosecution or persecution than ever before. Christians bullied just because of their faith. And then Jesus talks about lawlessness. Lawlessness will abound. Today is our days full of violence and murders and innocent bloodshed. You know, we live in the shadow of Philadelphia. And every day you turn on the news, it's not whether a murder occurred, it's how many occurred that night. Lawlessness will abound. Why? Because man's heart has become hardened, it has become cold, and it has become filled with evil and violence. Heaven's mighty angels stand poised and ready once again. But this time, they will not be held back. And Jesus will not return as that meek and mild Lamb of God. He will return as that Lion of the tribe of Judah, issuing out judgment upon those who have rejected him. Friends, we're on the doorstep. Christ's return is imminent. My message is don't make the same eternal mistake as these soldiers made. Don't fall into the snare of following the crowd. Don't be caught knowing the truth, but failing to do anything about it just sitting back watching. Not only did they watch Christ complacently, not only did they watch him calmly, but they also watched him carelessly. Christ on the cross. 
This was God showing us, proving to us his unconditional love for us. He was taking our place on that cross. And what were we doing? Verse 35 again. When they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by his prophets. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. What were they doing? They were gambling for his clothes, for his garments. And in that, we see another contrast on Calvary's cross. On one side, we see Jesus being stripped. He's unclothed by mankind. But on the other side, it's sinful man that's being clothed by his righteousness through his shed blood. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, apart from Jesus Christ, we are left in our sins, our dirty, filthy sins, and we have no righteousness of our own. The Bible makes it very clear, it paints a very clear picture that we all fall short of God's glory and his goodness. Amen? These men at Calvary, they sat there, they watched him, the Bible says. It says sitting there, uh, sitting down, they watched him there. They heard every single cry that he made from the cross. From that first one where he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then the thief that that acknowledges who he is. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus tell him? He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Then as Jesus looked down at the foot of the cross... He sees his earthly mother Mary there and John, his disciple, the disciple whom he loved. And he looks down at them. He says, woman, behold your son. What was he doing? He was separating any earthly ties at that point because no longer was he uh, Mary's son. He was now her redeemer, her savior. Then he cried out, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he said, I thirst. And the sixth cry, he said, it is finished. He said, it is paid in full. And lastly, as he bowed his head in perfect submission, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. They all heard it. They all watched him there. They saw everything in front of their very own eyes. They were all given the truth. And they all were given a choice. What was their choice? They chose to reject Christ. They chose to do nothing but sit there and watch him complacently Calmly, carelessly, they chose to ignore the one who was before them and stay in their sins. They chose to do nothing and just keep things the way they were. Today, this morning, every one of us, we are faced with that same choice. And the choice is, what will we do? With Jesus. And that's a personal choice. It's not a choice we can make as a group, as a church body. What will I do with Jesus is a personal choice. Many think, well, I'm 
I'm just not ready to make a choice today. But you see, that is a choice. That's you choosing to do nothing. Just like the Roman soldiers. Doing nothing is a choice. Your choice is staying to stay in your sins. Don't make that same eternal mistake. Don't sit there and do nothing. Come to Christ. Come to him in faith and find forgiveness, find healing, find comfort, and find peace.